Welcome in, and it is my pleasure to welcome back the lovely, delightful Lady Colin Campbell. Welcome, Lady C, back to the show. We are so excited to have you back. Thank you very much. It's lovely to see you again. Well, we have a lot to talk about and little time. So as you say, we will plunge right in. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, one of my viewers mentioned to me that I neglected and it mentioned rightly so that I neglected to follow up with you on a question we had discussed uh, a while back about when then Prince Charles uh, was possibly going to pick a different name as king. And I mentioned, I asked you, would it be possible for him to pick Philip? You you said that there had never been a King Philip. So my my viewer wants to know, does that negate, negate any possibility that he would have taken on a name that had never been taken before? Is it is it look is it frowned upon to try a new name or must they stick with the established names? Well, I suppose if it had been his name, there might have been a press, there might have been a reason to break the precedent, but since it wasn't his name, and there actually was a was a King Philip consort of Britain, mm. of England, King Philip II of Spain, who was married to Mary Tudor, was known as King Philip while they were married, because in those days the Queen Regnant's husband was the king consort. But of course, Philip II then lodged the Armada against England. So I don't <laughs> think it would have been a very good idea to have the first Prince Philip, sorry, King Philip Regnant being named after the King Philip consort who <laughs> lodged the Armada. <laughs> okay, you're right. You're right on that. <laughs> Very good. Uh, another question about names. Um, we really don't know over here across the pond. We ha we have all these questions, and you are our encyclopedia. Say William and Catherine had wanted to name George, um, maybe Jeffrey or something. Is that frowned upon? Are they? How do they go about selecting the names for those directly in the line of succession? Royal children and, in fact, children from all good families in in most parts of the world. I know in America it's different because, you know, you have somebody with four surnames. I had a boyfriend who had three surnames as his names. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, so that's very American to use as a Christian name, a family surname. But in, in most, most families I know, you usually name people after people within your family. Occasionally you name them somebody who you are very close to. Uh, but that's quite unusual. So no, it's it's usual that you that you don't go outside. I mean, the way Harry and Meghan, you know, with you know Prince Archie Bunker and <laughs> Prince Lilibet of the Pond, you know. Oh, yeah, that was that was that was they crazy. They sound like a very. They sound like a sitcom from uh, a very. Uh, from the, shall we say, the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> I agree. I agree with you there. Um, now, actually, now that we're talking about William and Catherine and their kids, um, William has recently stated he does not want a big ceremony like uh, Charles had for uh, at Carnarvon Castle for being um, Prince of Wales. Is, is there going to be any kind of ceremony or are they just going to let that slide and he's just the, the not just, but the king, the Prince of Wales now and there's no pomp and ceremony about it? Well, many princes of Wales have not been invested. So, you know, there's really no reason why he has to be. I mean, Prince Charles was invested as <laughs> Prince of Wales when he was. But I mean, that was something that was invented virtually. 
Uh, there are many princes of Wales who were never, ever invested. And there are political reasons why it might be a good idea to keep it quite low key. Because, you know, there's a Welsh nationalist movement. Mm -hmm. And they don't think that we, they should have an English Prince of Wales. They think they should have a Welsh Prince of Wales. Of course, there hasn't been one for several hundred years, nearly a millennia. But, you know, you have all of these movements that people need to be mindful of and respectful of because you don't want to make too many waves. That's true. Uh, but William and Catherine did live in Wales after their marriage and he worked there. So he has a closer tie to the, to the country and the people. I was hoping that that would kind of disengage the, the, those that want separation or want a, a Welsh Prince of Wales? Does does his popularity, is it is it larger than um, what Prince Charles was when he was Prince of Wales? Do, do the people at Wales gravitate towards William and Catherine being that they have basically had their lives started there? Well, I think to people who are neutral or who are pro-monarchist, it's a positive thing. To people who are anti, there's nothing that would be positive, say, vacating the position. Mm. So, you know, you need to bear that in mind. And, uh, respect their existence, try not to antagonize them, and preferably move on from the argument before it becomes too vociferous. Okay, another question that... Um... We, we recently obviously had the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. That to the world was just like, boom. There, it, was, it, was, it shook up not only the UK, but the world. You know, we've had her for 70 years. Um, question is, monarch like Netherlands, they have a tradition of when the, when the monarch gets older and the next in line, the heir, becomes more adult and mature and can handle the responsibilities. They, I don't like to use the word um, abdicate, but that is what it is, but they step they down. Abdicate. Yeah, they, do abdicate, yes. they advocate in favor of the younger ones and make the transition quite a bit easier than what we had with the death of Queen Elizabeth. Do you think that is a, a nicer way of handling it with, with the population because obviously your country just, boom, was thrown for a loop when uh, when the queen passed. And I'm, I'm thinking from my point of view that it would make it a lot easier to have the, the transition, you, you know what I'm saying, a little softer. I see what you're saying and there are pros and cons either way. The fact of the matter is that an English monarch, a British monarch, is crowned, and at the coronation, they take an oath for the whole of their life. So you can't abdicate, because you would be breaking your vow before God. So if they're going to abdicate, they have to abdicate the way Edward VIII abdicated before taking the coronation oath. Once they've taken it, they would be breaking their oath to God. So there's no question of abdication once you're crowned. Okay, I did not know that. See, I always learn something with you. I thought uh, when Elizabeth made that a uh, statement, in, in Africa about her whole life, dedicating it longer, short. I thought that was what she was honoring. I did not know that she took an oath in the coronation. So see, we learn something all the time from you. This is great. The only European monarch who is crowned nowadays is the British monarch. All of the European monarchs aren't crowned anymore. So no. this, yeah, so this, uh, this, 
stepping down, abd abdicating. To me, that that's that's a because of what happened with Edward. The word abdication is is cringeworthy when it comes to the British monarchy. But um, do you think in the other countries that do that, it's it's easier for the population versus what you guys went through with the uh, the death? Yeah, of because we have the benefit of the monarch for the whole of his or her life. And, you know, the queen was a wonderfully effective monarch. Two days before she died, she, you know, received a new prime minister. So she was working to the very end. And I mean, especially nowadays where people retire relatively young, it's rather, uh, reaffirming for those who like work <laughs> to see that you actually can work for 30 and 40 years past the retirement age and be fully functional <laughs> oh and indeed she surely was she she was up until the very very end um prince <laughs> I, I hate to say this but prince uh harry has this book coming out. I have been skimming through different channels on YouTube and various articles. And a lot of people are speculating that possibly what he might say or, or write about could be construed as, as treasonous. What would he have to do or say to be treasonous for? He would have to require the death of the king. That or, or the physical harming of the king, that would be treasonous. But he's not going to do that. And, you know, they don't. I mean, the king and the Prince of Wales and the rest of the royal family, and indeed, ever, I can't think anybody in, in Britain who would want to see uh, a member of the royal family tried for treason nowadays. I mean, you know, this isn't the age is the age of the Stuarts and the Tudors. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, they're very simple. Yeah, I think some people do wish it were still the age of the Tudors, because Harry and Meghan would have been silenced a long time ago. <laughs> Put their head. <laughs> okay, well, getting back to them, um, you have uh, a petition, and we're going to put the put the address on the screen that people can go to uh, sign up. I, I think I was one of the first to have Harry put his title of Duke of Sussex into abeyance, and hopefully, I don't know how how many people you have signed for that yet. But um, like I said, we're going to put the put the address on the screen so my viewers can go and sign up. That is to take away the um, title of Duke of Sussex. And, no, it's to put all his titles into abeyance. And Prince. OK, that, that was my next question is how do they take away Prince as well? So he, it would be he would put he would put his royal titles in to abeyance, so he would become Mr. Henry Windsor. Oh, from your mouth to God. <laughs> that, that would be heaven I for us. God is sleeping at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think the people in, in uh, the UK think that Americans embrace Harry and Meghan. We don't want them here any more than you guys wanted them there. Let me put it that way. He... Uh, when he, what really, really frustrated me was on our, um, he went to the USS Arizona in um, Honolulu. That's a sacred ground for American military. It was the start of America coming into World War II, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He went there all dressed up, uh, looking like he was representing the royal family. He doesn't. We want him out of our business and seeing him in one of our sacred monuments really bothered this country and the people of this country. 
Oh, I'm glad for your marriage. <laughs> how, how did that go over in in the UK with his, with his going to the USS Arizona? That that's a that's a a major monument for the country here. Well, in fact, it's not created waves in Britain because I don't think people understand the significance of it. You know, it's just been reported as, oh, here goes Harry again, pitching up somewhere where he has no business, you know, but, but there's not been any sense of outrage about it so much as, oh, Yawnsville, here goes Harry again. You know, people in this country are mightily sick of Harry and Meghan uh, pretending that they are the alternative royal family. And that, you know, let the royal family take Britain and the Commonwealth, they'll take the rest of the world. And since the Commonwealth consists of a goodly proportion of the world, they'll take the Commonwealth as a second stop and just leave the family with Britain. I mean, it's... It's madness, it's crazy time, it's delusional, it's pretentious to the nth degree. Uh, it, it is, and I say that um, we don't want them here either because they're they're just causing so much conflict and using their their cipher, which I heard you mention that she's perfectly, Megan's perfectly in her rights to use the cipher, but still writing to uh, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives as the Duchess of Sussex is infuriating to us because we, if we had wanted the monarchy, we wouldn't have had the Revolutionary War. So, yeah, it, 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 it boggles our minds how Megan, who has grown up in America, feels entitled to be... Uh, using her title to just go about her business. It just, it doesn't make sense. Well, it it does if you look at it from her point of view. You know, I've hustled my buns up to the position of Duchess of Sussex, and this is my calling card, and I'm going to slam it down on every table and everywhere so that everybody knows that I have arrived and you all need to acknowledge my existence. And once you've done that, maybe then you'll listen to me and bend a knee because I am the very special Megan. And you serfs and swine and characters, and we mustn't forget the hands flying all about the place. <laughs> you know, she's, she's a, she is pathologically attention seeking. And she uses anything to get attention. And of course, her real credibility lies in the fact that she is married to a British prince. But for that, she would be the non-entity that she was before. She was a D-list cable television actress, not even a star of the show. She was the love interest. So aside from the tea lady and the coffee woman, she was the lowest member of ranking member of the female staff of uh, uh, ensemble of suits. And now you can't pick up a newspaper or a, ma a magazine. Well, certainly there are magazines that rely heavily on advertising and PR. And she's in them virtually every issue but then they're paying very they've been paying good money for that you know i mean they if i i don't know if you've heard that there was a dispute with sunshine sacks because they owed sunshine sacks two million dollars wow okay well who's who's paying their bills now because they are um who's buying who's buying their their uh, awards now because they are getting more awards and not not rightly uh, they, oh. 
they're, they're, they're buying all their awards. Where's the, the true royal family? Those that are working royals give out awards and, and honor those other people, whereas Meghan and Harry seem to be, they don't want to do that. They just want to be honored. Well, really, what she wants is to live out her childhood dream of getting an Oscar. Oh, thanks to my mother and my father and my nanny and all the all my school teachers and the boy next door and the one beside that as well. And, da, da, da. and you know, the 20 minute speech while the music is blaring increasingly loud. That's her fantasy. And since, because by her own admission, when she was young, she used to enact receiving an Oscar, but she's never going to receive an Oscar. So she's receiving all of these awards. And I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's all PR. It's my hand scratches your back, your hand scratches my back. And it's, it's a form of prostitution. It's prostituting a, a royal role that should have no question of being sullied by transactionalism. It should always be above suspicion and the royals are supposed to be lending their presence to worthy causes, not <laughs> arranging for to get presents ts because of the presents ce uh, at royals and a, a, a dirty exchange of money some or or some commercial transactionalism in the background the whole thing is sordid and distasteful and it sullies the whole of the transaction but what I find interesting is that, because you see, Meghan has a friend who, John Fitzgerald, if I remember correctly, <laughs> who's quite a power broker in the, in the Democratic Party and knows the Kennedys, etc. And of course, let's remember, within the Kennedy family, there's a lot of jockeying for position and a lot of competitiveness. And you know, Caroline Kennedy is like the fairy at the top of the Christmas tree. Then you have the subsidiary ones, the Bobby Kennedy lot, who splinter into several different fighting segments. So, you know, it's 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 not all as copacetic, let's put it that way, as it would appear to be. And I gather that Bobby Kennedy Jr. has come out roundly <laughs> condemning and good for him, you know, but yes. Terry Kennedy, she she wanted something that would get a lot of attention, and this has got a lot of attention. And it's it's unfortunate that Kerry Kennedy and Meghan and Harry don't understand that there is such a thing as bad publicity. And sometimes no publicity is better than bad publicity. But there's a whole school of thought in the PR world and in the media that any publicity is better than none. And I don't agree with that. I think that's entirely wrong. Well, I, I agree with you because I think what uh, what Carrie Kennedy has done this last time with this has sullied the reputation of her father in uh, I, it. Even Robert Kennedy Jr. said he does not believe that these these two represent the ideals that his father stood for. So she I mean, no, they, not only do they not represent, they are contrary to a lot of Bobby Kennedy's ideas. Mm -hmm. And so, and if you compare all of the other awardees. These are, I mean, you know, they're donkeys in a, in a race, horses race. I mean, it's not a donkey race. It's supposed to be a thoroughbred race, horse race. And there you have these brain asses, because that's what they are. Crazy. 
I, I personally feel, and you tell me if you feel the same way, that uh, this uh, Robert Kennedy Award is uh, doing some damage to the legacy of Robert Kennedy in the same way that Harry is doing damage to the legacy of Diana, because he keeps, the, the man is almost 40 years old and he's stuck in the past with the grieving of his mother. Can anybody get through to him about that? Can anybody say, hey, wait a minute, look at you've got to grow up, you've got to let this go and live your life without always referring to your your mother. She obviously she 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 left him at an early age, but he just cannot move on. Well I'm afraid I don't quite see it like that. He moved on very well after she died. Uh, he moved on too well because by his own admission he didn't really grieve fully which and there is there is a paper that was done in the 80s which i've referred to previously in other fora uh failure to grieve and melancholia in youths under the age of 14. and so i get that harry has had some valid issues because he was two weeks short of his 13th birthday when she died. So he was one year short of the, of really the transitional period. And so we need to cut him some slack for that. But you know, had there not been the crock of gold that Megan has discovered at the end of this rainbow, there is no way that, that poor Diana's corpse would be gouged and revisited and displayed and and uh, constantly troubled on on a weekly basis by the both of them it's because they she has spotted what she thinks is a merching tool and that it is in their commercial and worldly interest. And he is actually, I don't agree that he is at all grieving for his mother at this stage. I think he is using his mother's existence, yeah. gratis his wife and her, her methods of enrichment, not only financial enrichment, but in terms of attention seeking. I think it is a total abuse of his mother's for of his mother's existence. I mean his mother is dead for God's sake, let the woman rest in peace. you know and they are sullying Diana's reputation because every time they come out with some false notion, uh, to big themselves up and, and puffing Diana up as well. The flip side of the coin gets examined and the whole thing is very injurious you know, of her continued exist existence as a public figure. I think it's very damaging. I, I also agree with that. But unfortunately, I don't know why and how we always run out of time with you. It goes by so quickly. We would love to have you back sometime around the coronation time. And let me ask you, do you expect an invitation to that? Or is that nothing that uh, you might might not see in your mailbox? Well, that's not a question that I would answer one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll find out later on down the road where you will be on that on that well, wonderful day. Now, you know, the people who qualify for the coronation, and in fact, the old rules are not going to apply anymore because the people who used to who who were entitled to an invitation are no longer entitled to an invitation. So the whole question is open. I mean, there are, I, I don't want to get too deeply into it because I don't want to tell tales out of school, but there are issues with very well-established people whose 
families have been going to coronations for generations, hundreds of years, who most likely won't be asked this time. So, you know, we live in a very uncertain world where everybody is concerned, including those who used to go to coronations and who most likely won't go. I mean, mm. I would be very surprised if I go. Let's put it that way, you know. Oh, yeah. but, but, but I'm also, I know from people who've been to coronations, uh, of course, I'm old enough to have had relations who went to the previous coronation. And it's very uncomfortable. You yeah. have to arrive hours early. You can't depart once you arrive. So you so you have to be careful to not eat or drink too much. <laughs> yes. duration, and there's nowhere for you to relieve yourself. And it's really uncomfortable. It's also cold. <laughs> no matter <laughs> how warm it is, it's cold because you are you used to be in full evening wear, long dresses, gloves, uh, etc. Well, and, unfortunately, and we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lady Colin Campbell. Uh, Lady C, you are such a wealth of information. We always enjoy hearing from you, and we will have you back. Uh, sometime near the coronation, uh, we'll get some more information from you, and we'll have a lot more to learn. And in the meantime, again, my thanks for sharing some time with us today. And for the viewers, I'll see you next time. With over 30 years of experience in real estate in the mortgage industry, Darlene Mays provides knowledge and expert guidance to clients looking to buy or sell a home. Serving clients throughout South Orange County, Darlene specializes in the senior community of Laguna Woods Village. Darlene works with her clients to ensure the highest level of service, from the beginning of the process right down to the closing table. If you are looking to buy or sell, who you work with really does matter. Call Darlene Mays today.